It's a good thing that conservation biologist Dayan Stojanovic has a head for heights. For me, when you're at the top of an enormous forest giant and you can see the ocean on one side and snow-capped mountains on the other, and you have curious swift parrots perched two metres away wondering, what are you doing at my nest? I would never take an office job. Diane studies swift parrots because less than 2,000 are left in the wild. Two years ago, he was shocked to discover their population is being decimated by sugar gliders. Back in 2015, we brought you the amazing story of the world's fastest parrot, the swift parrot, and how it's being eaten out of house and home by a bizarre predator. 12 months later, we've returned to Tasmania to find out what's changed for this endangered species to survive. This is a good news story. Thanks to generous donations, Dayan and his team have installed hundreds of nesting boxes in areas free from sugar gliders. Your couple of bucks that you threw to our random internet campaign has literally bred baby parrots this year. It's been amazing. Each summer, Every swift parrot in the world flies to Tasmania from the Australian mainland. The birds are looking for a safe hollow to lay their eggs and raise chicks. Magnificent trees like this Tasmanian blue gum are absolutely vital to the many animals that use its hollows to nest and breed. But it takes at least 150 years for these hollows to form, and that's the problem. There's just not enough of these old trees left. Swift parrots have two very distinct habitat requirements. They're related, but they're separate. They need enough food, but they need also enough nesting sites. And they can't breed in any decent numbers unless there's enough food, but no one can breed unless there's hollows. So having those two quite separate resources overlap in space and time is critical. When they breed, swift parrots feed only on flowering blue gums and black gums. But these trees don't flower every year. Dayan and fellow researcher Matt Webb have studied the flowering patterns long enough to be able to predict where the birds will go each year. Over the last decade, they've been monitoring 1,000 different sites across the entire southeast of Tasmania. One of the really important things that come out of that work and the modelling that we've done is that it's only a small fraction of the breeding range that's actually available each year and it's due to these flowering patterns. They also keep a record of each hollow used for nesting. But industrial logging, land clearing and firewood collection all take their toll on this scarce housing stock. This bushland near Hobart was home to 50 swift parrot nests until a wildfire toppled many of the old trees. Nearly two thirds of the hollows were lost within six months of the wildfire. So a really big spike in collapse of both the hollows and the trees that supported them. How many generations do you think would have lived in this hollow? Well, it's, it's hard to say, but I can say that over the decade that we've included this hollow in our monitoring program, we've had swift parrots nest here twice, and musk lorikeets, tree martens, green rosellas, owlet nightjars, probably sugar gliders as well. Unfortunately, its life is over now. On top of habitat loss and a shortage of hollows, the parrots also have a surprising predator. Diane discovered that sugar gliders devour not only the eggs and the chicks, but the nesting females as well. We now, over five years of researching this phenomenon, have quantified that approximately half of the adult female swift parrots get eaten every year. And this level of predation is just so severe that the swift parrot population can't tolerate it. He found a strong correlation between predation rates and loss of old growth forest. And so in places where old growth has been reduced to as little as 20% of the available forest cover in an area, predation by gliders can reach 100%, which means every, every bird dead, every nest failed.
Sugar gliders were introduced to Tasmania more than a century ago. While they're now common throughout the state, the good news for swift parrots is that they haven't made it to the surrounding islands, like here at Bruni. Swift parrots that nest on the islands, on average, have extremely high success rates. In excess of 99% of the birds that nest on Bruni Island do really well. Which led to an ambitious plan. Why not provide extra hollows in safe places with no sugar gliders and lots of food to give Swifties a chance to build up their numbers? They designed a nesting box based on the average dimensions of a swift parrot nest. <laughs> this is like actually so similar to a real swift parrot nest, but it's amazing. Except for great. Except for being square. Yeah. <laughs> it's wicked. <laughs> a crowdfunding campaign raised enough money to build hundreds of them. Their campaign attracted support from some of Australia's leading cartoonists, like John Cadelka. As a political cartoonist who, who deals with politics most of the time, it's incredibly heartwarming to see people given a chance to help and to trust that that help will be followed through on and to actually put, some, put their money where their mouth is. When we last saw Dayan in 2015, he was putting up the first nest box. Since then, there's been plenty of hard work hauling boxes up trees. We've been able to say, OK, we think that the flowering is going to happen on North Bruny Island, and using that information from our monitoring, we've preempted the arrival of the parrots and spent the winter putting up over 300 nest boxes for the birds in the in the hot spot of food availability. This is box, uh, I think it's 106 on this hill and there's 200 at least uh, in this patch. A female is preparing to nest in this one. Over time, we're going to get more of these boxes used, but so far, of about 50 or so nest boxes checked, we've got nearly 20 of them occupied. It's amazing. In addition, a small army of volunteer arborists from the Victorian Tree Industry Organisation used their talent with chainsaws to carve more than 50 new hollows in trees. The parrots seem to like the results, perhaps because the new hollows match what they're searching for. We had swift parrots moving into cut hollows within three and a half days. It was amazing. They were done on the Saturday afternoon and they were in there by Wednesday morning. It was, it was pretty remarkable. This is the first carved hollow on this hill and it has eggs. <laughs> it's amazing. Population modelling by Dayan's team found the species could be extinct in just 16 years. That led to its listing as critically endangered. Any extra birds in the population oh. extend that extinction date. It's chicks. One, two, three, four. In a natural hollow, he finds the first hatchlings for the season. Most of my job is walking around finding dead parrot nests and so it's quite a pleasant thing to, to be able to look at these nestlings and know that their fate is not going to be determined by sugar gliders, it's going to be determined by the amazing conditions that are available this year for these birds. By doing things like deploying nest boxes on glider-free Bruni Island and enabling more birds to have the chance to breed in a safe place, we're buying some time for the swift parrot population until we can figure out how we're going to manage the sugar glider problem on the Tasmanian mainland. The lethal possum trap he trialled last year didn't work. Now the idea is to test a natural hollow that's glider-proof. A light-activated mechanism that shuts the door at night might keep the eggs and chicks safe from nocturnal gliders. But even here on Bruni, on an island free of possum predators, and elsewhere on the Tasmanian mainland, swift parrot habitat is still available for logging. None of the threatening processes that affect swift parrots have abated at all, and we've known about these processes for over 20 years. This is a significant proportion of the global population of swift parrots. I mean, this is a critically endangered species, and literally every individual counts when you get to the low numbers that we have for swift parrots. So to know that on, in a year like this, these birds are all going to 
make it and they'll end up returning to breed in other years. It's great. I mean, this is exactly the kind of boost this with parrot population needs. Well, it's turned out magnificently, as um, we've seen. It's, uh, it's great to have a, a problem in the world that can actually be solved. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know it's really good luck to be pooed on by a bird? <laughs> it's a bumper breeding season on Broody Island. All of the existing natural hollows are occupied and starting to produce chicks. Eggs are being laid in the new hollows carved by arborists. And now, for the first time anywhere, baby swift parrots are hatching in the nest boxes as well. Build it and they will come. I had an inkling that if we gave them more nesting habitat that it would get used. But really, until you try, you don't know. And it's just such a relief that, uh, that the, the money that we've uh, spent and the public support that, uh, that's been given to this project can be kind of rewarded in such a, such a real way. Seeing eggs and, uh, and nestlings in these boxes is just phenomenal.